Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this warm welcome. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Gürtchen, for, for inviting me to this conference. It's uh, each year, it's, it's a great highlight to spend a few days with you in such distinguished company and uh, talk about important things and sometimes also less important things. As the night goes on, the less important things become dominant, but they are part of, convivi of the convivial order of uh, uh, human beings about which I will have a few th uh, things uh, to say today. Well, democracy has been uh, covered a lot uh, uh, by our uh, distinguished guest, Hans Hermann Hoppe, who has become famous in our day as a critique of, of democracy. But of course, as Hans uh, did not uh, tire to point it out himself, uh, democracy never had really a, a good press uh, with uh, political thinkers in the past. Uh, the only reason why it's somewhat different today, why there's virtually no professor of political uh, philosophy or of political science who says anything against democracy is because they're all paid by the state and they're all paid by the democracy, uh, democratic state. Uh, so all uh, uh, people who are somehow intelligent have something to say against democracy and cannot bring themselves to make the sacrifice, the intellectual sacrifice uh, uh, to, to the god of our time, right, democracy, well, have no place at uh, state-funded uh, universities. Um, so if we look in, in, into the past, now this is a bit of uh, disorder here. Uh, I have here uh, various people, so this is in the middle is uh, Plato and uh, Aristotle, both of them lived in democratic Athens, and they were not fans of uh, democracy, right? So certainly not fans of the democracy of their time. Uh, so this was uh, for them as a, a rule of, of the proletarians, a right? rule of the mob, mob rule, and they were not in favor of that. Uh, they were themselves inspired by Plato, who comes a bit later. The, for me, the, the initial impetus for, for choosing this topic because I'm not really working much on, on uh, democracy. I'm very much a student of, of the topic, like uh, you know, most of in, the, in this room. Uh, uh, came from uh, an encounter with uh, just uh, this gentleman, with uh, Augustin uh, Cochin, Augustin uh, Cochin, uh, who is a, is a French uh, uh, philologist and philosopher, historian. Uh, who died in, in uh, young at a young age, at the age of 39, in World War uh, I, in one of the uh, Somme battles. So this is him working in, in, in the archives. And Cochin has, had become, in, in his day, a famous uh, critic of uh, the French Revolution and uh, the, the origin of the French Revolution. And by historical studies, he dem delivered really a, a demonstration that the um, uh, French Revolution was anything but a spontaneous democratic uprising it was very much uh, the, the result and more or less the inevitable result of several decades of uh, preparation in what Cochin called the Société de Pensée. So I'd say intellectual clubs, very much like our club. Right? But these intellectual clubs that uh, emerged in France in the 18th century were inspired by Rousseau and by Rousseau's uh, theory of, of the social contract. So the purpose of these societies was to form the public opinion, the, the, the will of the people, la volonté uh, uh, générale, uh, so that an poli informed political process could take place. So the, the operating principle of these intellectual clubs was that people would gather together and discuss about all things. And they called themselves, amongst themselves, the philosophes. Right? They were all philosophers by virtue of, <laughs> of being member of, of the club. You were a, a, a statutory <laughs> philosopher. And then at the end of the meeting, or of several meetings, they made a decision, a collective decision on what the right opinion or what the right value was on any, on any, uh, any topic. So in this way, right, they prepared uh, both uh, intellectually, but also especially as far as the organizational preparation is concerned, the advent of the revolutionary days of uh, 1789. And it was not a, uh, an accident that the re revolution then turned into a democratic uh, revolution of, uh, of this model that had been so, for so long prepared. And uh, Cochin, he emphasizes at some point that we'll, I will uh, come back to talk about uh, on the, uh, in my present talk. Then, of course, uh, our Hans Hermann Hoppe. And there were two images are uh, lacking. One, one is uh, Socrates. Okay? Socrates got in trouble with uh, the Athenian authorities of his day for two things, right? For uh, worshiping strange gods. And the strange god that uh, Socrates was worshiping was the one god. There's only one god, right? There's not a, a multitude of gods, there's only one god. And he had come to the conclusion that there can be only one god by a purely theoretical philosophical argument, not by any theological uh, or divine revela revelation and so on. And that's what made him so unpopular. 
in his day. And the second ground, but it was a derivative of the first, the second ground was that he was seducing and spoiling the youth. Right? He was teaching things that were not amenable to be profitable to the polytheistic society of Athens of, of his day, very much that and Hans had become politically unpalatable by a preaching, well, that democracy is not the god of our time, right? That is whatever the god is, it's not democracy. So it made him very unpalatable in Las Vegas. That's a little outline that will follow. I will first talk, uh, try to make a case for democracy, for the good democracy. Right? So the uh, democracy that is part of uh, a free society, a uh, society that could be appreciated by libertarians because it is based on uh, the respect of private property rights. And so it emerges as a, a spontaneous uh, arrangement of people within the convivial order. Now I use this, this term convivial order I'm borrowing from uh, a philosopher that I admire very much, namely uh, Frank Van Doon. He is a professor of law at the University of Ghent. He is now an emeritus. He has for many years a uh, speaker at this conference. And um, uh, Frank, in, in, uh, in, in his work, he had always uh, distinguished uh, between uh, three um, uh, basic forms of uh, the social together. Uh, one is the convivial order, so that's the libertarian society, which is, is based on private property rights, people dealing with uh, each other as equals, uh, and so on. Uh, the second one is uh, society. So in society, you introduce the element of representation, like, for example, in a commercial society, in a, in a firm, and you have uh, some people who are directors and so on, they, then you have hierarchy, you have subordination uh, and uh, all these things. And the third one is the, uh, the community. Right, so community based on sh shared convictions, uh, shared values, uh, of course, in the case of, of a family, but then also can be a religious community, uh, uh, an aesthetic community, uh, 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 a philosophical or theological, uh, theological community, uh, uh, or monkish order or whatever. And so they are based on authority. You don't have an organization, but there is deference to a common authority, like we have deference in the society to our good friend Hans Hans Hermann Hoppe, right? So he's the authority within our little club. Um, and uh, so can be distinguished from convivial order and uh, society. So I'll develop the, the idea of democracy within a convivial order, libertarian order, and then distinguish it from democracy uh, of a coercive sort, and uh, then de develop further how the, the introduction of the state modifies even a coercive democracy and then I highlight some of the cultural and political consequences that follow from it before I draw some practical conclusions. So in the uh, democracy within a convivial order, I think we, we can distinguish um, uh, three elements that uh, come into play, namely uh, conventions and contracts. Uh, we always have some voluntary representation, so there is representation, but it's voluntary and we have voluntary subordination. Um, uh, and of course, in a coercive democracy, all of these elements become coercive. And it results from them some sort of a natural de democracy that we find uh, instantiated very rarely in history, but at least we get some approximations. So fundamentally, uh, and this is a theme that um, uh, uh, Augustin Cochin uh, emphasizes very much in his opposition to these, uh, his critical uh, research on these Société de Pensée, which were geared toward uh, collective decision making. Well, he points out that, uh, first of all, in a, in a uh, normal social si uh, 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 situation, it's very rare that we find any sort of agreements. Agreements are very much the consequence, the spontaneous consequence of the social together. Uh, rather than uh, something that springs from the nature of things themselves. Now, as an economist, let me phrase this a bit differently. As an economist, we know, thanks to, uh, well, Plato, Aquinas, uh, Ricardo, Mises, and all the economists today, they explain to us the benefits of the, of the division of labor. The division of labor is beneficiary, beneficial for all people involved on material grounds, right? Each person involved in the division of labor can obtain more goods of material, spiritual, or whatever uh, sort, um, uh, then he could possibly produce on his own, right? And the only key to this uh, uh, little miracle is that he cooperates with other people who are different from himself, so the talents must be different. So that's the incentive to cooperate with other people. 
it, it makes that, and Mises has pointed out, it makes that people who are prone to be aggressive and uh, distrustful and, and so on of other people, well, they're still drawn toward these others because they have a material interest to do so. Right? So even if we dislike others, you know, they're, they're shabby social, uh, socialists and gender uh, theoreticians or advocates and so on, we'll still cooperate with it. We're selling them goods. We are uh, uh, hiring them uh, among our personnel and so on we are, because we're benefiting from their cooperation. So that's a little miracle. The difficulty is, of course, to come to terms, right? to find an, an agreement. And here, uh, Cochin emphasizes this point, and I think it's a very important point, that the natural state of affairs is that we don't agree on things. Right? We don't fully agree on things. Right? Even if it's purely descriptive, if you wish to describe I mean, what's, what does this bottle look like. Now, I were to ask each of you, well, describe this bottle, I guess out of the uh, 60 people or so in this room, we would get, whatever, uh, uh, 59 different descriptions of what this is and how it looks. And right? so we don't really agree on this. And if you have really an argument with your wife or with your husband, you'll find that, well, sometimes you see, you think it's obvious how things are, but they, they are not, right? <laughs> Apparently not. There's very different ways of seeing the world and of appreciating the different elements of the world. Right? So it's a laborsome and, and difficult process to come to some sort of uh, agreement. And uh, the agreement that we reach, well, they come through speech acts, of course. They come through argumentation. They come through threats, uh, different sorts of things that come into play. And so we, we share our view with these others, the gratuitous act, right? And then we exchange, right? And we, uh, in, in, in exchange, of course, we come to a partial agreement on what we want to be done, right? We have a, a, an agreement that does not necessarily cover all of our world, world, all things that are somehow relevant, but a very narrow specific area in which we say, yeah, here, uh, you own this, I agree on this, you are the owner of this apple, I'm the owner of the, the pear, we agree, both I'm the owner of the pear, you are the owner of the apple, now let's exchange. That's really what's going on in exchange. It's a very partial common ground that we find. And that's the beauty of an exchange, by the way, because it shows that, we, well, we actually don't need to agree on everything in the world. Right? We can still cooperate on a, on a partial basis. And that's really the, uh, the starting point of, um, uh, of civilization. Now, as Hans Hermann Hoppe has pointed out in his work, that, of course, in any exchange of the sort, there are certain um, prerequisites that, even though they may not, may not be explicit, uh, invariably involved practically. So there's always involved a recognition of the other as something, somebody, a person, uh, different from uh, ourselves, a person, not just an individual or a thing, a carrier of rights and obligations, of claims and obligations, with whom we can make a deal. And so implicitly there's some, also some sort of convivial equality that we recognize, because we are exchanging as equals in, 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 in thought, in speech, and in, in uh, rights and obligations. And the result of this, the spontaneous consequence of this, is the convivial order. It is what emerge, emerges when people are free to operate with each other. There was, is, there's no institutional impediment that prevents them from finding common ground, as far as it goes, to share ideas and, and be rejected, misunderstood, uh, disagreed with and so on, but also find uh, common ground for cooperation, for exchange, uh, uh, for, for intellectual activity and so on. Um, various um, uh, thinkers have underlined the productivity of disagreements within a convivial order. Right? Uh, so many, um, uh, especially the democratic uh, theoreticians, but many people today in political science, but also in economics and other social sciences, I think fall prey to the uh, uh, error of assuming that agreement is a particularly desirable state of affairs. It's good that we have community based on full commun uh, agreement and so on. Whereas Mises and, and others have always underlined the productivity of disagreement. And the, the basic exhibit A here is always what's happening in an exchange, right? If I exchange a pear against a, a, an apple, well, there is a disagreement about the relative importance of these goods for me and for the other person. We just agree that, well, he's the owner of that thing, I'm the owner of the other thing, and we want to switch uh, property rights. That's the only thing on which we agree, but not on the significance of these goods uh, in the world. Right? So uh, exchange would not take place without disagreement. But then, of course, disagreement is also fundamental for market competition. What happens in market competition? Well, people pursue different projects. 
or they pr pr pursue different ways of producing a car, different ways of producing bottled water, and so on. And they're com competition with each other. They don't want to cooperate. Right? They want to do their own thing. Right? And this is really the, uh, the spring, the uh, uh, fun spring of, of uh, uh, progress, uh, intellectual pr uh, progress, uh, our knowledge, and of course, material progress, as we know so well. I move on very quickly. Right? So the next uh, element that we can also distinguish on a, a purely voluntary uh, basis that is, is part of the convivial order is voluntary representation. And of course, we know this uh, from the various forms of uh, voluntary uh, delegation with which we are familiar, right? We have wards for um, uh, uh, people who uh, cannot take care of themselves, very f small children, very old people, handicapped people, and so on. They need somebody to take care of them. Um, uh, commercial agents for, for, for firms, uh, uh, club presidents, and, and various others. Um, now, in a, a purely voluntary setting, uh, let me highlight that uh, such representation is characterized by uh, its limitations, right? It's uh, limited uh, especially by two elements. Uh, one is the, um, the means that can be uh, uh, used by the representative. So it's a delimitation of the stakes. What, how much of our time may he uh, use or may he represent and how much of our material goods may he or she, uh, she uh, uh, use? And the other one is the uh, finality. To what purpose may the representative uh, engage myself or uh, act on my behalf? Similarly, there is voluntary subordination. And of course, we know this from uh, community, uh, which we find natural authority. Parents are natural authorities of, of children, because children, as they know by experience very well, they wouldn't get well, well along with mom and dad. There would be no meals on the table, no protection from the evil guy, evil boys living next door, and, and so on. Uh, and so there is natural authority in, in, in here in a family, but also in a, a larger community, the village community, and so on. Then we have um, uh, conventional authority, and here we come back to Frank Van Doon, who distinguishes this element. Let's think of a commercial society, right? We have a, a firm. Uh, maybe a, a corporate firm, and so uh, there is, there's a board, and so on. The board is uh, uh, the representative of the firm. Um, there's subordination. Employees execute the wills of the of the directors, but this is conventional. That is, it's authority granted uh, by contract. Right? The employee. This is another uh, uh, economist of our time, Pascal Salan. He has very much emphasized this point. Right. He, uh, a contract of an employee does not, strictly speaking, manifest a hierarchical relationship in the sense that the employee is the serf uh, of, of, of the Lord, right? But it's hierarchical in the sense that, this, that the employee consents to being directed by the uh, director in a very limited uh, field, right? In the eight hour or, or so period per day that he consents to uh, rent out uh, to um, uh, the employer. Uh, one German uh, sociologist, uh, Robert uh, Michels, um, in the early 20th century, uh, he had um, destroyed the egalitarian hopes of uh, German social democracy by pointing out, well, there's an inherent tendency in any social organization uh, to turn to uh, oligarchy, right? So the, uh, the uh, proletarians within the uh, SPD, the social, uh, social, at the time it was still the Socialistic Party of, of, of Germany, they were desperate that the higher ups were uh, hanging out at parties with the, uh, with, with, with the capitalists and so on, were very much behaving like capitalists. And so uh, says, well, this is just an oligarchy. Uh, it's not the ideal society that we would wish for. And Robert Michel tells them, look, I mean, uh, this is not at all unnatural or surprising. It's what you should expect in any social organization. Because in any social organization, there are always people who are more interested in doing certain things, so invest more time in this. And there are people who are just better, naturally better, at, at uh, playing the game that is at stake. So you're, for example, running a political party. So these people naturally come to rule uh, the party. And um, the same thing was pointed out by various sociologists, by the way, already in the 19th century, and Augustin Cochin also emphasizes uh, this point. Now, what I should uh, uh, like to point out here about this, this oligarchy 
is likely to be small or even absent in purely voluntary sub, uh, subordination. And the key reason is that uh, if um, you have a, a purely convivial order, exit costs are low, right? And it's always possible to exit, right? So there's no um, obligation for anybody. It's, we are not forced at the uh, at a gunpoint to stay within the party or stay within the organization. You can switch to something else because there is, in principle, competition is admitted. And that's uh, one of the big differences as compared to the present day political system, which is very much so, so rigid and monolithic because exit costs are increasingly high because typically they are illegal and you cannot completely exit the whole system. So therefore, within the uh, purely convivial order, there's something like natural uh, democracy. Uh, I need to pay attention here, right? So democracy, the word has these two elements. So there's a demos, right? So there's, this, there's a people and uh, they, they rule, right? There's this cutting. Now cutting, strictly speaking, is coercive. Right, so in a way, right, so what I'm describing here is a theoretical construct of a libertarian theorist, right? So the, the voluntary democracy by the name uh, itself, democracy is always coercive, right? So, but yes, so it's the rule, it's the voluntary rule of the people. Theoretically, it's conceivable within a, a theoretical uh, 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 convivial order, and it comes as a spontaneous effect of conviviality. Uh, Mises and, and the American economist um, uh, Fetter, Frank Fetter, uh, have uh, uh, described that this uh, democracy naturally results from a private property order uh, because private property is fundamental in a, in a market uh, economy and the market process itself is uh, an element of uh, uh, democracy, right? So the, Mises called this market democracy Right? Every dollar is uh, spent is like a vote cast in favor of this and that uh, product. And Murray Rothbard has um, uh, proposed a very nice um, uh, uh, comparison between the market democracy on the one hand and political democracy in his book, uh, Power and Market. And you'll find this on the opening pages of Power and Market. Okay, I need to hurry up, and I will. So I <laughs> think coercive democracy, Right, we have three uh, elements. We have uh, coercion, and coercion we can define along our libertarian economists um, uh, as a violation of private property rights. Right, so it's a deviation from acquisition of property by homesteading and by by contract and by by pure gifts. And uh, what distinguishes coercive uh, democracy is that people are coerced at the uh, point of uh, of a gun, if necessary, into collective decision making. Right, so they cannot, uh, they cannot make certain decisions on their own. They need to make them in unison with other people. So this is a very elementary form, a theoretical form of, of democracy. So we forget about the state, we forget about political parties for the moment. Right? We just say, okay, we all agree, like in a Société de, de Pensée in the 18th century, uh, on certain things, we only proceed uh, in unison. We only, we, we do not make any decision um, uh, in, in deviance from what the others think or what the majority thinks, and um, uh, and uh, any deviation will be punished. So in that uh, moment, um, the the element of decision becomes crucial, and actual agreement on any issues uh, recede in the background. Right? It's not necessary to convince everybody of uh, the truth or of uh, the, their interest in a, in a certain deal, what is necessary is to bring them to the point that they decide in, in this direction rather than in another. Right? And this uh, decision may, may just involve, well, I'm choosing the lesser evil. I'm not convinced both things are wrong or both things are bad, but because I'm obliged to choose, well, I have to choose one thing or another. And clearly this changes the attitude toward others and again, uh, Augustin uh, Cochin here, he emphasizes well that as a consequence, well, uh, lying, manipulation, uh, 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 pre preparation uh, of, of, of meetings and so on take place in, 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 in such a context. So the other is increasingly, the other person is not seen as a partner, as a, a person equal in principle in rights and in obligations as ourselves, but as, as a victim. Uh, that uh, I should uh, um, uh, not take uh, care of. 
And another a consequence that follows from it, from this political process that now sets in, well, is the formation of uh, political parties. So my argument is that political parties are a necessary consequence of the uh, um, collective decision-making, coercive collective decision-making as such. They do not just result from the introduction of a state, but they come from uh, collective decision-making. Because if decision is the crucial element, well, then we have the, uh, uh, the interest in gearing decisions toward the right uh, result. As a consequence, we get a tendency toward political centralization within each party and cartelization of the different uh, parties in themselves. So I don't have time to develop this now, but the, the, the parties uh, have a common interest. Uh, typically, all members of all parties want the party to play a, gr a greater role in the political uh, process. So they have common ground there. And uh, they therefore have uh, the incentive to strike deals, come to partial agreements with all the other parties as far as their shared common interests are concerned. So the natural consequence is a growing opposition between the representatives and the represented and the emergence, therefore, of a political system. And so we're talking about a situation we don't even have a state. And the, uh, what is interesting in Cochin's study is that he shows that the system emerges in a pre-state phase. Even if the state is officially monarchical, you just create this uh, element of uh, collective decision-making per se, it generates a process that leads to this result. So the state, of course, reinforces all bad elements of, <laughs> of, of the collective cursed uh, decision-making process, right? Because the state can create legal monopolies, most notably in money, uh, law, education, information. Uh, the state, through various means, uh, through uh, regulation and also to subsidies by uh, uh, paying for advertisements in, in TV stations and in newspapers, can create propaganda on its behalf and so on. And the state can also eliminate uh, competition right, by co-opting any uh, uh, people who have some talent, some political oratorial skills, and, and so on. They're co-opted. Right? That's what uh, the, all the transatlantic uh, foundations uh, do, the Fulbright, and I don't know what. Right? So they bring in anybody who can uh, barely speak three sentences in a row without screwing up. Right? They bring them all uh, in. And of course, they eliminate competition as far as possible. We see it in Germany, for example, in the, the fight against uh, uh, the IFD, and in, in, uh, uh, in the US, the hysterical opposition uh, to, to Donald Trump. And then, last element uh, is, of course, uh, coercive democracy. Well, it's really the representatives who run, who consider themselves to be the owners of, of, the, of, of the whole, of the whole country, and so on. And all others are just uh, uh, elements that may be more or less compliant or uh, uh, disturbing, right? Disturbing the order. And so, if necessary, well, we export any people who do not comply and we import people who are likely to comply. Now, I really definitely run out of time. Okay, da, 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 da. So you see, right? I oppose Mises' case for democracy. Okay, I won't go into this. Because if democracy is not a culture of rationality, of reasonableness, you find much material on this topic in a book that Hans Hermann Hoppe edited uh, some 20 years ago, The Myth of National Defense, especially in the opening chapters, and which, which you see, I mean, there are systematic reasons why democracy entail a very emotive, emotional uh, way of uh, interacting with others. And it's, it's again, it's linked to this basic element that in a coercive democracy, what counts is the decision. It's not agreement on anything, it's the decision that counts. So as a consequence, uh, you use all the techniques of mass manipulation, which are typically appeals to emotions rather than uh, reasons, right? Both because most people are limited in their intellectual uh, abilities and uh, the emotional appeal is much more uh, rapid uh, than a long-winded argument and so on. Right? Few people have as much time as we do and discuss things for hours and hours in the evenings uh, here, the pleasant evenings of Bodo. And uh, it, uh, we get a culture of legalized uh, robbery, uh, of course. Uh, in the uh, uh, old world, we had uh, slavery, okay? And uh, I think slavery has not really ended because if you pay more than 50% of your annual income in tax, uh, well, I don't know which other word you wish to use, right? And even if it's just 30% or 20%, you're a partial slave. I mean, that's the plain fact. So we get a culture of legalized robbery, which is reinforced by our present monetary system, of course. And then finally, 
we get a, a, a move away, very strong incentives to abandon, abandon the uh, monotheism uh, for which uh, Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato found theological grounds and which were developed then by the Christian uh, philosophers, uh, theologians, and also by Muslims and, uh, and, and Jewish uh, uh, theologians. And we get a turn back to the good old days of Roman and Greek polytheism uh, and, and corresponding uh, relativism. Right? So in conclusion, right, the root of the problem seems to be uh, coercive democracy, not democracy as such, which reminds me of a very charming incident. Uh, one of the first things I learned from Walter Block, uh, when I met him, Walter uh, told me that he meant a good German friend of mine, uh, uh, Stefan Blankatz. He is a, a well-known libertarian philosopher in Germany. So Stefan goes to some libertarian conference uh, and brings his sister, okay? The sister is a communist. So she walks up to Walter Block and says, hello, I'm so-and-so uh, Blankatz, and I'm a communist. And Walter takes her hand and looks at her very friendly and says, oh, uh, my name is Walter Block. So you're a communist, voluntary or coercive? <laughs> <laughs> and that's a crucial point, right? So as a, as a libertarian, as Austin, we have no reasons to be opposed to be, uh, democracy in principle, right? It's not democracy that is really the problem. Voluntary democracy is fine, right? As long as it's competitive, as long as you can get in, you can get out. The root of the problem is coercion, obviously. Right? And then as far as practical reform is concerned, well, we need to ex uh, push toward the uh, reduction of the extent of the state. We need to uh, uh, work on uh, getting rid of legal monopolies of the various sort, especially uh, central banking. And of course, we also need to come back to, the, uh, to, to inverse the hierarchy of norms, right? So hierarchy of norms means international law comes before national law, comes before regional law, comes before local law. And the, the sound uh, hierarchy in a libertarian society is from bottom up. Communal uh, rules come first, uh, all regional rules are complementary, subsidiary, and then the same thing for national and international. Right? And as Frank von, um, uh, David Dürer has uh, explained to us, there is even no reason why we should enshrine this into law, right, can be competitive. So let's go, let's go medieval in, in, in that respect. Well, thank you very much for your attention.